Hey you geeks! It's amazing how much of an effect C.S. Lewis has had on modern fantasy and how no one talks about it. Like everyone who's commenting on Good Omen Season 2 is talking about how progressive and groundbreaking the series is and they're not wrong but from my perspective. This is the same as where I just came from. I thought it was over. Oh, that's just great. That doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. Oh no, there is something incredibly cathartic about watching Good Omen Season 2 while house-sitting for your godmother in her wasp suburban pristine home. I know, I'm such a rebel. Without further ado, here are 10 things that no one is saying about Good Omen Season 2. Spoilers, of course. Number one. And you're watching Disney Channel. Good Omens is basically Paradise Lost adapted for Disney Channel. Like, Disney Channel shows premises can sometimes be incredibly terrifying. Take Lab Rats, for example. A mad scientist genetically modifies three teenagers in his basement, and the show's like... But you are about to enter a soul-bruising, confidence-crushing, apocalyptic environment. High school. <laughs> These shows have the philosophic depth of a shot glass, which is a great accoutrement to the viewing experience. Good Omens takes the mind-bending concepts of demons and angels and heaven and hell and turns them into the factions of a high school musical. No, no, no. Hey, Paradise Lost deserves a good roasting. As I understand it, it is immoral to dig up John Milton's remains and burn him at the stake for heresy. So I won't do that. Instead, I'll just enjoy watching Neil Gaiman disintegrate Milton's work in this great show, Good Omens. Number two, David Tennant Choose the scenery. What are you doing in this bookshop? Ah, hate to watch him go, love to see him walk away. You know, I've never actually seen a full episode of David Tennant's Doctor Who, yet I still get excited to see him walk into a magical elevator or hear this line. You never know when you'll need it. It's a container, so it's bigger on the inside. I'm just here to watch the odd couple of my generation. She's a good woman, a good time. Seeing David Tennant and Michael Sheen play off each other is comedy gold and oh, so much fun. Number three, heaven is for really boring. Now we get to the crux of why Good Omens has all the philosophical depth of a Hallmark special or a Pure Flix film. All of the above make heaven out to be some sort of bland, whitewashed, uppity institution full of snobs. Through in one, hurrah! Though Neil Gaiman throws in the zest of divine incompetence straight from Paradise Lost, rather than angels being all-knowing disembodied intelligences of the highest order, at best we have bumbling, endearing bumpkins who struggle to understand the concept of tea. I always say the best part of a cup of tea is looking at it. <laughs> it's, it is funny, and yet I wish Neil Gaiman had gotten his hands on whatever mushrooms that Dante or Joan of Arc got their hands on in the south of France back in the day, because a psychedelic rose in heaven 
really spices it up and brings the whole room together. Number four, the Crowley letters. Fine, I'll do the obvious and compare good omens to the screw tape letters, famous for imagining hell as a bumbling bureaucracy. We're in hell. I have authorization from Beelzebub. And you could have authorization from Satan himself, Louis. If I don't have him, I can't send him over. So, where screw tape had pages of meaningful insight into the human condition and understood a very insidious use of the word affection, Hell's mid level management, like Shax, doesn't understand sarcasm? His royal smugness is in trouble. That's so sad. Is it? Why? Sarcasm. We'll work on it next time. It does make some sort of sense for an incompetent bureaucracy to promote incompetence, and mid-level managers everywhere don't understand sarcasm, so why should Hell be any different? Funny thing is that Hell actually has more human residents than Heaven. Therefore, Hell is somehow more competent than Heaven in this series, no wonder why it has such a bleak outlook on death. If the only destination choice is hell, then of course hedonistic self-preservation is the way to go on Earth until you die. As you are slowly digested over a thousand years. <sighs> Second thought, let's pass on that, huh? Number five, sex of intelligence. The show's gender fluidity of angels and demons is one concept from the Abrahamic religions that I think the show adapted surprisingly well. In the Christian tradition, at least, classically, angels were considered to be disembodied intelligences. Therefore, they are as different from each other, gender speaking, as a human being is from a horse. This is, of course, not the approach that C.S. Lewis took in Paralandra, and that is why I have a lovely rant on the topic in that video. This is why the ancient texts describe angels as multi-winged or burning wheels with multiple eyes and all on fire, not to mention giant inexplicable floating things. Giant floating baby head? What's that even about? So, seeing an angel in a wheelchair or having Lord Beelzebub being portrayed as female is somehow a better description of what the ancient authors were going for than those cutesy precious moments statuettes that make people think they can fit heaven into their living room. As Good Omens itself says. Well. It's just a little bit too, uh, ineffable. Another dead giveaway uh, that this ain't Lewis's conception of heaven and hell is that Shax is clearly wearing a bra, which, according to Lewis, for the demonically inclined, is anathema. Number six. Where does the book say that? All right, all right, it doesn't exactly say that. You're gonna lambast a literal interpretation of Job, you could recall that Job had seven sons and three daughters, not three total like modern suburbanites. You see, I'm Keziah, daughter of Job. And I'm Anon, son of Job. And I'm Jemima. I made this part. Mm. <laughs> she did, but also daughter of Job. I do appreciate that Gaiman took a far more charitable approach to Job's wife, as traditionally it's interpreted that for the man who lost everything he ever loved during the value, the fact that his wife didn't die kind of spoke, uh, volumes. As if the devil would take her, I thank him for his pain. Points for originality and charity in that choice. And yet, even as I'm watching the show, I'm vaguely going like, he didn't have three children. And I'm a Catholic. It's not like I've got the Bible memorized. Rather, when I did open that particular book and it begins, 
once upon a time in a kingdom far, far away. I gotta wonder, is this supposed to be some sort of biblical fairy tale, maybe? And it's not supposed to be read literally? Though the whale is pretty cool. Number seven, Jane Austen. Brains behind the 1810 clock and well done, Robert. In case anyone was wondering, Clerkenwell is what I would call a neighborhood in central London. And it fits very well with the overall vibes of this show, with evident religious roots in its name, derived from Cleric's Well, it in Elizabethan times being outside of the city of London, was home to so many brothels. And there, house pick of a fine stable of ladies, all able and willing to mend her shirt or darn her socks. Then, beginning in the 1800s, around Jane Austen's time, jewelry shops did begin to move in, so it's conceivable that Jane Austen could have orchestrated a diamond heist. Though the historical records of any particular heist occurring at this time have been lost to the internet, at least. If she did do such a thing, it would explain why she is more uh, widely well-known for hating London. Why have you not come to see me? Were you not in London? Have you not received my letters? Yes, I had the pleasure of receiving an information you were so good as to send me. That's why, in all of her novels, bad things happen in London and bad things happen at balls. Aziraphale was totally just tempting fate by throwing an Austin-style ball in London, thinking it would solve everything. Of course the demons would attack. That's truly ostentatious. I think you're overestimating how much trouble we're actually in. <laughs> Number eight, Metatron. Fun fact, the name Metatron is not the name of a Transformer. Pred snapped this in Siberia. He's been seen at all six horn locations around the world. ID confirmed, Megatron. It can be found in the Talmud. Wikipedia says that he has a role in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but I am unaware of him appearing in any other Christian-esque works aside from Good Omens. So if you've come across him in any of your reading, let me know down in the comments. Gaiman's Jewish background may also explain why the divide between heaven and hell in this series is more like the divide between Sheol and heaven as understood in some Jewish traditions. Sheol being the universal afterlife for the dead, and while it is underground, it's not exactly hellish, I don't think, but it ain't exactly a psychedelic rose viewing platform of the divine everything. Number nine, marriage of heaven and hell. I knew I had to do this video once Gabriel and Beelzebub started having chemistry. Really come my way. Hey, hey, hey. I heard wedding bells. It appears that I now have an outlaw for an in-law. Insofar, of course, as two disembodied intelligences of unknown gender who are incapable of reproduction can be said to be married, their partnership is totally a marriage between heaven and hell. I didn't collaborate with heaven any more than Gabriel collaborated with hell. I just found something that mattered more to me than choosing sides. Their union of sorts totally embodies the concept that good and evil are just basically the same thing and that we on Earth are just doing the best we can with what we have. This seems to be in line with the book of the same name that inspired Lewis to write The Great Divorce. 
I haven't read that original book yet, nor do I plan to, though it seems like Gaiman has read both. And in one of the deftest writing maneuvers I've seen on shows this season, hits both in an epic 710 split. Number 10, The Great Divorce. With Gabriel and Beelzebub eloping off to some remote nebula, the happy ending for our boys is all but assumed. And then the Metatron arrives and offers Xerophel a position which makes him think he can have his cake and eat it too. He said I could appoint you to be an angel. You could come back to heaven and, and everything like the old times. Is your little sad little puppet dog eyes in the scene are just so <clears throat> Yet, I kind of gotta agree with Crowley on this one. For all of Heaven's positive branding in this show, they aren't offering life in abundance on any plane of existence, so why should I side with them? I'm a millennial. It is all about me in the end, isn't it? Yeah, I'm siding with Crowley. We don't need heaven. We don't need hell. They're toxic. We need to get away from them. Just be an us. Thus, we end with the great divorce of Crowley and Aziraphale. One going directly to heaven and one going directly the other way. Which means we are definitely getting a third season. This is the point where Luke has lost his hand. Frodo is assumed dead in Shelob's lair in the books, and Batman is on the run from Gotham's finest. Once the writer and actor's guilt strikes are over, which I am sympathetic to, but I need to make these videos for my health, we are definitely getting a season three with the final union of heaven and hell and earth rising and railing against that institution. Thank you for watching to this point. This month has been rather challenging for me. I had a death in the family, and I'm trying to keep things light and fluffy on here. So please like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more, and leave a comment telling me what you thought of Good Omens Season 